Well, good morning, everyone. It looks like it's about time to start. Um, I have a happy announcement to start us off with this morning. I think that I was able to add everyone who was on the wait list and who was attending and who was here on Thursday. Uh, so we should be okay. I'm not sure that Telebears is very fast, you know. It doesn't, it's just, it's only a computer. So it doesn't catch up on this uh, kind of thing very quickly. But if you have been attending and you were here last time and uh, you are on the wait list, I think that you've been added. So check with that and check with me afterwards if you have any questions about that. Um, also, if you have a couple of spare hours a week and you want to do something nonviolent with those couple of spare hours, uh, we're starting to develop a lot of projects at the Meta Center and uh, we need a lot of help over there. So I guess for starters, if you just come and mention it to me after class and I'll, I'll see how many of you are interested in what we can do and having a long meeting with the, the staff today. And that sounds very grand, but actually it's two people I'm taking them out for lunch. But uh, <laughs> um, just a few more announcements before we started, get started. Uh, I, just, I heard about a very interesting piece of scientific evidence uh, on Tuesday. If you remember, there was a certain point in PACS 164A where we sort of ran through the scientific evidence for the potential of a human being to be nonviolent and affect others. And I heard about a very interesting finding, which at first I didn't know what to do with, but when I thought about it later, I thought it is indeed very significant. And the finding is this. They were studying Buddhist monks who were being asked to do what they call metta practice. <laughs> metta being originally the Buddhist term for loving kindness. So what they're doing is they're generating compassionate uh, feelings in themselves. I don't know exactly how they do this, but they, they bring up compassion. And while these monks are sitting there being compassionate, they are being, their brains are being scanned with these, this very sophisticated MRI technology to see what part of the brain would light up. And it is very interesting. As I say, it took me a while to realize how significant this actually is. Surprisingly, the part of the brain that is activated when you're having compassionate thoughts towards persons or, or towards institutions, that's a lot harder, but <laughs> say towards persons who need our compassion. The part of the brain that gets activated is the uh, motor area of the brain, the part that would drive you into action. So I thought this something very intriguing about that and later I realized what this probably actually means is that uh, I'm going to use an expression now which I'm going to go back and modify in a little bit. We are hardwired to act out of compassion. In other words, we are <coughs> physiologically set up so that the more compassionate we feel, the more our brains are ready to drive us into action. And that, that has obviously s obvious survival uh, benefits, not only for the group as a whole, but for the person or creature acting out of some out of positive uh, motivations. You see what happens when you act out of negative motivations that's going on in Iraq right now. Uh, so I said we're, <coughs> excuse me, I said we're hardwired to behave in this way. Scientists, uh, the, the more scientific scientists, hipper scientists today are, are not claiming that when there's a physical pathway that is what determines our behavior, but rather somehow that they use the term mediated is when you have compassion and you want to act out of that compassion this is being mediated through brain structures and through circuitry that has been connected up in the brain so we are not saying that this is physically caused but we are saying that when you know there are two basic objections that you'll meet with when you when you try to develop a nonviolent position with somebody the first one they'll probably say is it never would have worked against Hitler. By now you should be able to deal with that issue. And the second one they'll say is that it's not human nature. So what we're getting now is just more and more and more evidence coming in from every conceivable angle that in fact nature and especially human nature are organized precisely for nonviolence. I mentioned the the famous Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal, 
uh, last semester. He is sort of leading off a lot on that research. Okay. Okay, now we're still going through the announcements. Okay, we haven't gotten to the, the, the course yet. Um, trivia quiz. Tri Nonviolence trivia quiz of the week. I don't have any special t shirt on today, so I've got to, uh, re I'm reduced to this sort of thing. Uh, it turns out that yesterday in AD 41 was the day that the Roman Emperor Caligula was assassinated. Now, why is that significant? Do you remember how I'm talking to the people who took Pax 164A or who read my book with attention, with the attention that it deserves? Uh, <laughs> why is the career of Caligula and the way that it ended significant in the nonviolence story? Does anybody remember that? Not that he was a nonviolent person, right? He was like, he's like your quintessential bad emperor. Mike? Is he the one who ordered his uh, statue? Right. Caligula is the one who ordered the statue of himself as <laughs> Zeus to be put up where? In the temple. In the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah, that's what's important. So this was. This was a classic example of uh, a, a dictatorial person trampling on the sensibilities of people that he had no, you know, just, that he just didn't have any sensitivity to. And uh, if you remember my saying that the Johann Galtung, after much research, came to the conclusion that the problem in the Middle East is that we want access to their oil reserves and they want respect for their religion. So the clash of civilizations is actually a clash of egos. And it would be very, very easy to resolve it if we didn't have those egos and we had some respect for, for what they, what's important to them. But we, we don't have that. So this is another, you know, this has been going on forever. And in AD 40, this is what happened. And Caligula wanted a statue of himself put up in the temple in Jerusalem. The Jews. Uh, came flocking into the city from every corner, uh, especially of Galilee. Most of the big troublemakers came from Galilee, that was sort of the Berkeley of ancient Palestine. And uh, they, they said, you can't do this. And uh, Caligula ordered the Syrian legate who was in charge of military control of Jerusalem. His name was Petronius. He ordered him to put this down. And Petronius said, we will kill you. And the Jews just lay down and said, go ahead and kill us. So this is, what stage are we at here, folks? <laughs> stage three, right, you see it right here, if you look really carefully. <laughs> at stage three, once again, people en masse, this time not an individual, willing to lay down their life. And it turns out that in this particular case, they did not have to lose their life. Petronius didn't know how to handle this. He had incidentally slaughtered lots of Jews who were resisting in the ordinary fashion. But this was something that he didn't know how to cope with. Do you remember Bill Sutherland's little story from Danville State Prison where the, the, sheriff, the warden comes in and sits down and he says, you guys are driving me crazy. I, I don't know how to handle nonviolent resistance. You know? um, very, very important revelation. So anyway, Petronius sent a letter to, they didn't have email yet, you have to remember that. He sent, a he said, remember that. He sent a letter to uh, Caligula saying, maybe this isn't such a good idea because we'd rather have these people out in the fields harvesting crops so that we can exploit them rather than just have their blood running in the streets of Jerusalem. And Caligula immediately ordered uh, Petronius to commit suicide. He posted that letter and he, Caligula, was assassinated before the letter reached Petronius. So that's the whole story and the way it fits into the whole history of things. There, there are some seats on the other side if you want to go around the back. Yeah. The way this fits in, yeah, there's one here, but I didn't want her to walk in front of the camera. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, the way this fits in is that, in fact, there were about seven uprisings in the ancient Jewish world. About five of them were sort of nonviolent and of those three were successful and two became, two, two broke down and I think three were successful, one broke down, and one was mooted by a change in the, in the issue became irrelevant. But it shows you that nonviolence has been around for a long time, even though there have not been courses in it until relatively recently, and that does make some sort of difference. Okay.
So now what I'd like to do today is talk some more about the film that we just saw and then finally get around to analyzing in some depth this very brief account we have of the 1944 insurrection in El Salvador and the other things that it led to. And that will be a very good segue for us to next week's topic. <coughs> next week we really get into the heaviest kind of nonviolent uprising or activity which is insurrection which actually aims at overthrowing the government. Uh, not by constitutional means like the impeachment campaign that's going on, but uh, by whatever it takes. So um, I just wanted to start us off by d sharing with you that when this film was uh, premiered, this, this documentary, The Good War and Those Who Refused to Fight It, Bullfrog Films, yeah, for those of you who want to tell your folks about it back home, when it premiered in Oakland, it was very dramatic. I was invited to be on a panel discussing conscientious objection and nonviolence and the like, and I said my usual stuff, you know, yada, 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 Gandhi, 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 so <laughs> my usual. And uh, it went on, your people had very interesting questions, and then these two older people got up, guys got up in the back of the room and said, aren't you going to talk about us? And so we said, well, who are you gentlemen? And they said, we were in Camp 14, the Se Selective Service Camp. So they got the innovation of their life. Uh, there was not a dry eye in the house when that was over. And you could sort of see, you know, these guys had made that sacrifice 60 years ago. And finally, it was, they were getting some due recognition for it. So this was very, very emotional. So that's part of the reason that I've started showing this film. Let me review, as I recall them, some of the key points that came up that we were discussing last time, and we'll go on from there. I think that in a way this, what I'm about to mention is, and that we did talk about, is fundamental, absolutely fundamental. As you know, I believe that principled nonviolence, the kind that we're talking about here, I was going to put PNV on the t-shirt, but that would kind of mess it up visually, so we just stuck with NV. Uh, principle of nonviolence is the kind that begins from a spiritual struggle within the individual. And it sometimes is best described as a struggle against negative drives. And we were putting side by side this very dramatic uh, episode that David Dellinger des described himself going through in that prison. <coughs> prison is a fairly good place to go through spiritual conversions. <coughs> it's also a good place to waste your whole life without going through anything. I, I know because I've got <coughs> a couple of people who found my book in there and I'm in correspondence with them. But um, there's also the story of Ammon Hennessy, who was an anarchist in World War I and in prison. He was, r they put him in this jail cell with, with nothing but the, uh, the gospel. So out of sheer boredom, he started reading it. And he had this revelation that if he was going to be a true anarchist and really come out of the violent framework uh, of society, he was going to have to love the warden who was the person whom he most hated in the entire world at that moment. The warden had actually cheated him, told him he was going to be sprung, and then said, ha ha, we were just kidding you. So I mean, this guy was vicious and arbitrary, capricious, cruel, all these good Boy Scout virtues. and. Uh, Hennessy describes, he will never forget, he's walking back and forth in the cell and he just, um, he walked into the wall. It was such a revelation. He realized he had to overcome his hatred of that person, not just of mankind in general. So similarly, David Dellinger comes to the realization that he's not going to change his values. He's not going to change his position. Therefore, he's looking at a whole life of prison. He's going to be in trouble his whole life, which basically he was. I'm sorry to say he passed away just a few years ago. Um, and he, I guess, asked himself this very deep question, are you willing to go through with this? Are you okay with it? And he said yes. And the minute he was okay with it and let go of it, some new capacity, some new powers came, at, into his, uh, disp came to his disposal. So it's this kind of personal conversion that really lies at the heart of nonviolence, though we are going to talk a fair amount about how you build it out, how you make a movement out of it, what's been going on with them, and so forth. But 
My belief is that without this kind of personal change that there isn't really any, anything there to work with. The rest is just you know, tr tricks and structures. And as Johann Galtung said to me one time, I, I love dropping names of famous people. <laughs> So there I was talking to Maria Shriver, and I said, could I borrow your husband's motorcycle? <laughs> As Johann Galtung said to me one time, if unless you have some belief, some, you know, some sort of deep change goes on inside yourself, your nonviolence is just a set of tricks. And guess what? The other side has better tricks. So eventually you're going to lose on every level if, if you don't have it. If you've got that, you can it won't happen by itself, but you can figure out how to build that out into a movement and inst institutions and into a new world order, which is nothing, nothing more nor less than what we're aiming at here. Okay. Uh, all right, and then let me, uh, let me start us off with a question then. I thought it was way cool that they let them out to pitch softball when they had all been locked away in punishment camps, and it even, it even says something significant. Can you see what, what is so special about baseball that here you have these people who were condemned for basically betraying their allegiance to the country, you know, they're, they're locked away in prison, they're treated as criminals, but baseball is a different matter. <laughs> Why? What's just a slightly cynical question I'm asking here? What, what, do you th what do you think? Let me put it this way. What do you think baseball and war have in common that you might kind of weigh them one against the other? Matthias? Yeah. It's that we um, have the capacity to create heroes. There's yeah. There's yeah. the same one for another. And yeah. Yes, uh, es especially in all the things that you mentioned, your camaraderie. And what was the first thing you said, Matthias? Remembers anymore. Uh, but the victory part, yeah. Zoe? Well, also the concept of uh, uh, more of a power struggle. Power struggle, victory, maybe the single term that would embrace it that would actually get warfare and sports on roughly the same page is competition. It's this. It's negative struggle. It's, win, it's the belief that relationships are win-lose, and therefore the way to work out the order in the world, which is supposed to be there, is by a big cockfight, pitting everybody against everybody else. And the person who wins was the one who was destined to win. Um, and that's why, pardon my bitterness here, but when you're going into the presidential election of 2000 and uh, just two weeks before the election, Senator McCain was ahead of uh, the other guy, four letter name, and uh, the other guy's team played a dirty trick where they, they made a nationwide advertising campaign saying that McCain had done something really quite reprehensible. It was discovered after five days that this was a complete lie, no basis in truth. Guess what? It didn't matter. The point was that he knew enough dirty tricks to win, not that whether you know, the other person actually was this bad or was not this bad. So this is, uh, yeah. Let's take a moment now to turn off our cell phones. <laughs> um, so mind you. It, a nonviolent person does not have to say, I will never play baseball. <laughs> baseball is not itself violent, but it can be approached in such a way that, I mean, unless you get beamed with a hard boil, that, that's, you know, that's pretty hard. <laughs> but it can be approached in such a way where the, the key element is the competition. And then what you have is you just have this swinging back and forth between symbolic competition which is baseball, and outright competition, which is you know, shock and awe, bombing people. But that also is not ultimately grounded in reality, but that's another topic. Matt? Um, one thing that was interesting uh, about the context of the film uh, uh -huh. was that the, the pitcher wouldn't be uh, released to play the game unless yes. all the others were. Yes. And, and so that was like yeah. almost putting himself in a position of power that he, 
That's right. Which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, remember that. They, they, they wanted to just let this one pitcher out so they could win their game. And he said, oh, you want me out? Well, then let's bargain. I'm not leaving unless all my buddies leave. Yeah. Um, my brother, just, just wax a little bit personal here. My br the, the government, the U.S. government took an unhealthy interest in my brother in the 1970s. They wanted to send him to a South Asian country. He, he went to a North American country instead. Uh, and, uh, but my brother was a famous folk singer. Perhaps if any of you is from Canada, you've heard of Eric Nagler. He's very famous up there. His, his brother has failed to make it in the US, but he at least made it in Canada. And um, so it comes one Thanksgiving, and uh, Eric was part of a group called the, the Beers family, and they were quintessentially American. And so Pat Nixon invited the Beers family to play at the White House one Thanksgiving, not realizing that the lead guitarist for the Beers family is uh, languishing up in Canada because he's a conscientious objector. So they, uh, they wrote to him and said they'd let him come down to play at the White House and, and then go back <laughs> to Canada. <laughs> so, so he writes to me, you know, I'm his older brother, we still don't have email, so he's, he wrote or phoned and said, what should I do? And I said, agree to come down if they will let all the CEOs who are up in Canada come down and visit their families for Thanksgiving and go back. I think that was exactly the right thing to do. It did not turn out exactly that way. There were also some further very funny developments which we'll talk about at some point. But um, maybe this is a good opportunity for me to share with you one of my favorite Jataka stories. Uh, I think this is actually useful, and we will have an op we will be able to cover what we want to cover, even if I have this slight digression. A Jataka story is a story about the Buddha in his earlier incarnations, and this particular story is called the King of the Deer. Any of you, any Buddhists in the class, are familiar with this story? It's a very good story. If you have children or planning to have children, want to raise them nonviolently. This is a good story to tell them. Okay, it turns out there is a king who liked uh, venison, which is deer meat, and uh, so he organized these huge hunting expeditions and he went out and slaughtered deer every time he felt like it. And it was getting to be unecological, and uh, maybe the time was coming where they were an endangered species. And so they struck a deal with the king that if he would not hunt them in this cruel way, they would send one deer, I think each day or something, to the royal palace that he could use for his royal feast. So he said, okay, I can, I can live with this. So every day one deer, would, they would draw lots, you know, and one deer would go. So the king of the deer is walking around uh, his domains one day, and there's a pregnant doe who is weeping. And the king of the deer says to her, what's the matter? My dear, sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't resist that. <laughs> we'll try to get from grade C up to sort of grade B plus level. But uh, what's the matter? And she said, today is my turn. And it's not my life, but it's the life of my little fawns that I'm so upset about. And the king said, never fear. Uh, you stay here. I will go in your place. So the king of the deer goes and lays his head on the chopping block in the royal kitchen, and the cook comes out, and he says, whoa, I can't kill the king. This is a big tradition in India. You don't kill kings. Uh, I have a problem here. So he goes back, and eventually he has to go all the way up to the top and get the Maharaja to come down and, and talk to this king, the deer king who's lying there with his head on the block. And the, the human king says to the deer king, uh, you know, we're both kings. <laughs> you know, we're in this together, king, kingy old boy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't want to kill you. That, that wouldn't be right. I'll let you go. I'll just, I'll be vegetarian today. And uh, the, the deer king doesn't get up. And so the human king says, well, maybe you didn't hear me. And it would translate this, please, into deer language. I, will, I don't want to kill you. And he said, I'm not leaving here 
until you, you stop taking all of us. That you promise you will never kill another deer, otherwise I'm staying here on this block. And the human king says, whoa, you know, that's pretty heavy to renounce venison the rest of my life. It's not a very kingly thing to do. He says, but I have no choice, really. I'm forced. I can't kill him, and he won't go away. So I'm forced. He says, okay, okay. I won't kill you and you deer anymore. And he still doesn't get up. And the king says, now what's your problem? And he says, I'm not leaving until you agree that you will never kill another animal. And, and the king agrees. And of course, that king of the deer was the Buddha in an earlier incarnation. That's how the story ends. Now, I, I'm not saying this actually happened. <laughs> okay? Most of the other anecdotes and episodes we'll be talking about are historical in the normal sense. But it shows you with that story of the pitcher and with the, stu the way Gandhi drove his hardest bargains from in prison, it shows you that when they think they've got you in, under their control, you often have them under your control. It's very, it, we, in the next film that we're going to see on Tuesday, where we'll talk about, which talks about four nonviolent insurrections that took place in the 70s and 80s, what you'll s uh, one of the Philippine commentators, a, a priest, a bishop, I think, talks about the power of vulnerability. And I think that's a fairly good term for what we're hitting on here. Okay, anything else? Uh, that was a good observation, Matt. Anything else come up for us in this film? <coughs> Nick? Uh, I think this is a very good point that Nick is raising that the, the not nonviolent inmates in the prison and the staff, you know, the prison guards who were, I think, not unionized yet at that time, they wanted, for the honor of that particular prison, for Danville, they wanted that guy out and that maybe showed that they'd been affected. I think there's absolutely no doubt that not, we, we hear it from the warden when he has that moment and he, you know, he tr tests his will against the prisoner and he fails. He loses and he collapses and he says, I, I wish I can't wait to be dealing with murderers again as I know how to deal with those guys. Um, in the, sorry, I'm sort of rambling, but um, in the Ruhrkampf in 1920, uh, no, that's wrong, 24 I think it was, where the French and the Belgians invaded the Ruhr, which had been taken over by the French and because – no, it hadn't been taken over by the French, but the German government was supposed to take all of the coal wealth from that er area and send it to the French. And at a certain point, they refused. They, you know, they just did not have enough money to do that, and the French decided to invade, and the Germans resisted nonviolently. This is one of the famous – spontaneous civil nonviolent resistance movements in Europe. Another one took place during the Kapp Putsch just before Hitler came to power. But it was a s strikingly successful event. The French and the Belgians had to back down. And there were documents that were later recovered where one of these French generals was saying, I wish they would turn violent. Why don't they start shooting? Then I could wipe them out immediately. I know exactly how to deal with them. When they're carrying on like this, I am helpless. He literally said that. However, that wasn't your question. I just kind of got carried away. Um, I think in, the, in some – hang on one second. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, the question was, were the uh, not nonviolent prisoners affected by the witness of these nonviolent prisoners? My answer is absolutely without doubt they must have been, but it, you don't often get this documented. That's part of our problem. That's why I talk about this, these documents that they recovered from the French and why the sheriff's testimony – or I keep saying sheriff, the warden's – I live out in the country. The warden's testimony is important is it reveals 
the power of vulnerability as perceived by the side of the would-be oppressors. Now, what I'm saying is that happens millions of times more than we know. Uh, just trust me on that one. <laughs> or, or don't. It's up to you. But my, my claim is that uh, this is an invisible effect and we don't know how to monitor it. And it's not often recorded in writing. But when we say, remember we were talking about work versus work, that nonviolence will always do work. It will always be changing people on some level. And then you never know when that change is going to come to the surface and you'll see what you created. Okay, good. Anything else from the film? Yeah, and your name is? Christine. Christine? Yeah. Um, can you just say something about the conscientious objectors and non Right. Yes. Thank you, Christine. You asked me that on. Did you? Right, thanks. So, Christine's question is what about the uh, Luers? Uh, you know, was one. Conscientious objection has. There are different places you can draw the line. There's a famous uh, story about conscientious objectors in World War I. The book is called uh, We Shall Not Something. That's not going to help you a whole lot. <laughs> um, let me get the exact author and the title for next time. But there were 12 conscientious objectors in New Zealand during World War I who refused to go to the front. Tremendous pressure was put on them, and eventually two of them were brought to the front lines uh, in Europe to be, you know, on the British side. And one of them was absolute refuser. He would not cooperate with anything. But they wanted him up there in the trenches. They didn't want him back in the camp, so they had to, like, put wires on this poor guy and drag him across these duck boards and these mud fields until his clothing was worn away and his body was being lacerated. They did this to him every day. Now, there's another, another CO in the camp who is a uh, very similar case, and he writes the book, actually, and uh, he decided that he would go up to the trenches and stand there without a weapon. So that's where he drew his line. And these two guys argued. You know, you're not a real conscientious objector. You know, you know, so it really does become problematic. Here we have this principle, okay, I will not participate. But in what form will my non-participation take? And then you go even further down towards cooperation, you get these medics, and it's really troublesome. And in fact, I don't have any answer for it, and that's rare. You know, let's enjoy this, folks, because how often are you going to come to a question that, that I won't be able to make up some kind of an answer? But in one way, I mean, don't forget Gandhi did this twice. You know, Gandhi was involved in military service four times, and two of those times he was in an ambulance. He am actually uh, organized an ambulance corps. Um, so on the one hand, you're saying I, I, my job is to heal people, not to hurt them. You're giving me an opportunity to do this. I'll do it this way. But in another sense, you're sanitizing the war a little bit. In a way, and I'm not saying which way is right. I'm, it's a real dilemma. But in a way, it would do more harm to the war system if there would be no medics. And you leave the people there bleeding to death because the fact is, as we're seeing right now in Iraq, there's a certain number where the pain gets intense enough where people say, we don't want this anymore. It's a horrible issue. I don't, I don't really know what to say about it. But I have noticed that if you look at the fictionalization of war projected into the future, you know, like Star Trek and things like that, what they, okay, in the real world, weapons have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger till you know, a, a nuclear exchange would destroy everybody. But in their fantastical imaginations, it infuriates me because they make billions of dollars on this stuff and I can hardly keep one nonprofit going. In their imagination, weapons have shrunk down to these like these little flashlights. They go ching, ching, ching. You know, and what they're doing is sanitizing war so they can keep on fighting it. So that's, uh, you know, it, uh, nonviolence does simplify things tremendously and it solves a lot of problems, but there are still some gray areas. And, and I think what we have to decide about those gray areas is to leave it up to the individual's conscience. 
I think that's a very safe thing to do. You know, Gandhi said that um, if, a per if, you, if a person believes something to be right, for him, that thing is right and proper. In other words, there's a kind of relativism there, that if you do something that you believe to be right, you will eventually discover that it was actually wrong. But if you start fudging, you start like Quentin Coop saying, well, that you're helpless when you're part of a big system, then you'll never discover experientially whether what you did was right or wrong. So again, it's work versus work. You have the opportunity to convince or, or force everybody out of the army or let them discover on their own that killing is wrong. For purposes of long-term evolution, it's much better to go the other way. So that I think, I, I said I didn't have any answer for this, but it turns out I have one actually. And I'm, and I'm glad. <laughs> uh, I think in these gray areas, you just leave it up to the person to decide honestly what is the right thing to do. And even if it isn't the right thing, they will find that out. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? I've got one or two more I'd like to share with you. Yeah, yeah Matthias. Well, just kind of this answer the feeling of how difficult it is to resist. I mean, in yep. history, these people seem like were, were portrayed as cowards. Yep. Not fighting for the good cause and yep. whatever. And that is so present and yep. always been brought in and still is today. Yep. The, the big picture is always drawn. Yeah. Strong yep. Mass. And then there's a few people who say, we're saying is enough. Yep. Yep. They're portrayed as the, the weak, the yep. betrayers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I even heard uh, when I was when I was studying in Heidelberg, I, I heard an uh, overheard an argument in an office about some people that were not standing up to their responsibilities and one person was saying to another, Ach, sie sind lauter Kriegsdienstverweigerer. These people are nothing but conscientious objectors. <laughs> I wanted to, oh. So what can you do about that? One thing you can do is what some of those guys did. Prove that you're not a coward. You know, jump out of an airplane, have typhoid sh shot in your veins, starve yourself to death. Is this an ideal solution? No, I mean, we would like nonviolence to be for ourselves as well as other people. Shannon? I didn't catch the last part. Uh -huh. Oh, that's absolutely true. To be a conscious and just objector, as you were saying, Matthias, is to turn against this very easy downstream. Um, yeah, you, you are, your name again is? Marcella. Marcella, that's right. I wanted to say about this whole idea of like, what makes a man, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Now, now, you would. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really realizing that um, putting the message out that being violent doesn't make you a Yes. Yeah. Bullfrog Films did a very good thing in putting that letter in there. And it was ac the narration was very good. There's women saying, if you can really be called men. Now, this is an issue on which a lot of work has been done probably starting in the 80s. And in a way, to get rid of this idea that in order to be a man, you have to be violent, we would ultimately have to change the whole culture, which, as you know, I have no problem with. <laughs> but in a, maybe in a smaller way, 
we, we could approach it as a, an image of the meaning of a gender. And people have been working on that. There's a lot of literature and books on how we have genderized uh, violence in this way and how to get out of it. Uh, yeah, in the back. I just wanted to mention really quickly on that note for a second. Mm -hmm. There's a film called Tough Guys. Tough Guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Media helps, um, yeah. Push this portrayal of genderized violence. On yeah. Young yeah. And I think one of the things that we've been discovering in this work is that this is not so sweet for the guys. It's, it does not help them. It does not give them an easy ride to be told that if you trample on other people, you'll be successful. It's, it, it's not a, a very comfortable way to live. You're going against things that are in your nature. Zoe? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> There'd be no problem, yeah. So you're saying that the best way to deal with um, war nonviolently is not when the thing has already broken out, but in the run-up yeah. or way, way before. And of course, that's true. Then that remember that came up also that someone said to Asa Watkins, I think, uh, what would you do against Hitler? And he said, when? You know, in 1919, it would be a snap. You're way down on the bottom of Nagler's curve. I've got all kinds of things that I can do. So we should be thinking about the next one now before we get there. But I think it's very important for us to be aware that nonviolence has an answer even if you have to parachute us in at the last minute. They we're not helpless, we don't have to go back to violence. So meantime, we're talking about two other things as well. And, and one is the uh, courage that's required to go against the mainstream, especially I don't know, it seems to me that this is a qualitatively different issue because there are some things that people feel so deeply about that they cannot accept you as a human being unless you go along with them. And uh, sexual behavior is often in this category and whether or not you'll participate in the violence of the group is almost as deep. So it's not just like you know, I decided that I'm going to come to school with spiky hair or you know, purple or something like that. People will, will smile and they'll think there goes another crazy PAX professor. But nobody's going to be like, there won't be this deep rejection and very deep revulsion and dehumanization. But it has been the case since recorded history that participation in the group meant to carry out the warfare of the group. Um, in ancient Sparta, for example, there was a, a disenfranchised group, you know, this is sort of the, uh, the, the untouchables of the ancient Lacedaemonian world. And they were so outside the pale that they were fair game. Helots, they were called. They were fair game. You could attack them in, with impunity. They didn't have to train young men to be soldiers. They would take them out on raids where they would raid helots and kill them. But things were tough in those days. And there was a myth that explained the origin of the helots. The helots were tresantes, quiverers. They were the people who had run away in battle. And that's why they were, be they were not human, see? So you really, you, when you're becoming, when you're a conscientious objector, when your nation is under attack, you're going against something that's that deep. So what are you going to do? Partly, you know, you go and let yourself be starved for a scientific experiment and you prove that in fact this takes more courage, as you were just saying, Shannon, this takes more courage than what you're doing, to shoulder a rifle and fire at people. But what if you don't even have that opportunity? Amy, were you going to speak well, to that? I'm just remembering that like starting yourself for an experiment, but isn't something that's really helping the people in like the army and the Jews, you know, that are getting slaughtered by the Nazis? Mm. 
No, it doesn't help them directly. It, you know, starving yourself doesn't – although it helps them indirectly because you're going to have to deal with all of these concentration camp victims and so science is studying them to see how to deal with them. I mean, I thought that was very poor science, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a literature professor. <laughs> what do I know? Harvey? Uh -huh. So they knew that hopefully when the war was over and all these people were already yeah. starving and came back, how would they, they deal with that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I hate to be the, the wet blanket on all of this. I mean, what Arby is saying is true. They were studying this in order to help these starvation victims. But at the same time, the Allies were refusing to bomb the concentration camps. So it's a very mixed picture. There's no such thing as a good war. You can no more win a war than you can win an earthquake, as Margaret Mead said. So the picture is a lot more muddy than you think, and thus you ask yourself your question, the question, are we dealing with violence or nonviolence? Then things become clearer. But here's what I was leading up to. Um, there may come a time when you have no way to prove that you are indeed a man or whatever it is, and nobody will believe you. And if you're really committed to, you know, if your T-shirt says, I heart PNV, you go ahead and do it anyway, you know? Ultimately, ultimately you do not do nonviolence for a reference public. That's a term that sociologists use. And we, we talked about it in connection with the civil rights movement that they started orchestrating demonstrations in such a way that the public would get the message. And you do that when you're dealing with large numbers and you're dealing with a movement. But it, when you're talking about person power and your ultimate humanity, I think we have to be prepared to face the eventuality that we may be in a situation where nobody will appreciate us and the only friend we'll have is our own conscience. <coughs> Uh, personally, I think that if you're okay with that, eventually other things will come into line. Somehow people pick up on that and they grudgingly respect you. There's lots of stories like that in the annals of nonviolence. Okay. I, I think I had only one other thing I wanted to share on the film, for this go-round anyway, and that is uh, the, no the mention of Quaker relief work right after the war. There's a history there. Uh, in 1919, after the devastation of the war and the devastation of the influenza epic, uh, epic, still in my literature, uh, uh, epidemic, epidemic is what I wanted to say, um, the starvation in uh, Germany was absolutely appalling. It was absolutely inhumane. And there was only one group in the world that went in to give them some relief, and that was the Quakers. So with this group that we studied uh, the origin of last semester. Now, one result of that, this is an extremely dramatic story, which uh, I don't think you'll see written anywhere. I heard it from a Quaker, as a matter of fact. So I know it's true. Quakers aren't allowed to lie. Uh, <laughs> uh, this guy had a friend who was actually doing relief work among Jews in Germany in the late 1930s, after Hitler had come to power. And there was a particular prison where a large number of Jews were being held and, you know, they were going to be shipped out to these camps. And the Quakers, uh, two or three of them, they went into this prison and said, give us these people and we will take care of We'll get them out of Germany. They won't bother you. And so they were granted an interview with the commander of this prison. When, in, when they went in there, they thought they were sunk because they had never seen such a cruel, cold face as this person had. And he listened to them in stony silence for a long time and then dismissed them. And then they were sent a message saying, yes, you can have the prisoners. At which point they got on the phone and started calling around, you know, to, to French, the English, the Americans, and guess what, folks? Nobody would take them. So they never did get them out. So the story is very good because I think it shows you like it's, no, it's not a black and white thing going on out there. 
And it shows you that because the Quakers went in there in 1919 when nobody else would give them any relief, that the, the Germans remember that even in the Nazi era. And they allowed the Quakers to come in and do relief work even during World War II. Now, to just to add one little thing to that, um, we've been saying all along that, and in fact, Zoe, you said it here today, the way to overcome war is not to wait until it breaks out, obviously. Um, however, the fact is that you can also do something about the next war with the conclusion of this one. The way we ended World War I led directly to World War II. The way we ended World War II led directly to the European Union. Okay, so you may not think the EU is the greatest invention in the world, but uh, uh, you know, I'd rather be dealing with my little currency rather than euros and things like that. But, okay, but it's a step forward in some way. And I think, you know, not to get into the whole thing, but I mean the courts and all this, it is a step forward. Uh, but anyway, what's incontrovertible, I think, is that the way you deal with post-conflict situations has very determining influence on the future. This is a means ends thing. And in the last, I think since the truth and reconciliation experiment in South Africa, there's been a regular industry, if you will, or a field uh, about post-conflict reconstruction and reconciliation and how to do that in a way that it uh, defuses coming conflicts. With the Treaty of Versailles being absolutely the classic way not to do it. And uh, the exp I think we're at a very early stage with this experimentation. Okay. So I guess there was one other main point that we talked about last time that I'd like to reiterate a little bit, and that was that uh, these people were mainly getting into their nonviolent posture in a negative way through refusal. And yet, despite that, because of the sincerity and the authenticity of their position, uh, enor en enormous goods came from that th in the area of constructive program. Okay. So if it's not too much of a shift, we're now going to talk about our first uh, example of an insurrectionary struggle, actually aimed at overthrowing a government. And we have all of two pages of description of this little event because I didn't think we needed to spend too much time on it. In these two pages p of Patricia Parkman's introduction, you don't get the background and there is something significant about it. And that was that the Constitution of El Salvador at that time had a term limit for presidents of three terms. And uh, Martinez had just, ex his third term had just expired. And what he proposed to do was fix the Constitution so that he could have a fourth term. And that's when the people said, ya yeah, basta, <laughs> you know, enough of this. And they decided to resist. This is an important point for us to always have in mind. It's, uh, you know, partly it's the paradox of repression that we're talking about. In order to keep people down, you're going to have to push too hard at some point. And at that point, they will rebel. They will kick back. So it's a paradox. You can never repress people indefinitely successfully. I, am, I thought that there was, we were never going to reach that point in this country, but it looks like we, we are starting to rebound a little bit. Um, but also in, in a more general sense that it seems to be almost inevitable that you will cross a boundary where uh, even if you're not trying to escalate, as Martinez was trying to do here, you will somehow at some point get to a boundary where the time is right for people to stand up and rebel. And at that point, you remember the three criteria. You have to have a just cause. You have to have the courage to overcome, to break through the mystique of the power that are, that's holding you down. And then if you really want to proceed, to a movement that will have an enduring impact, you need to overcome the confusion of the opponent with the opposition. In other words, the person is not the problem. If you can find it in your heart to forgive the opponents as people while resisting their uh, repression of you as a program, you should be able to sail through from that uprising, which sometimes called 
the effervescence of the crowd, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit, to a permanent resolution of the underlying issues. Okay. So this is what happened here. Martinez uh, wants to amend, unquote, the Constitution. In May of 1944, the people silently demanded his resignation. And in only a few days, uh, pretty much uh, one week, uh, two months after the inauguration of his fourth term, he ends up stepping down. And the next point, which I've already emphasized, is that if you can make this magic happen in one regime, often it can spread to other regimes if the setting is right. And this is, of course, what happened in Eastern Europe in, uh, in, and in Europe – well, no, the eastern half of Europe in 1989. When, when the Soviet Union was weakened, you had this avalanche of liberation struggles, which I think all started in the Nikolai Kirche in, in Leipzig, but we'll talk about that episode in a little bit. So this is why uh, you often meet with extreme repression when you start a resistance movement. It's because the people in power know that uh, their power depends on a kind of mystique of invincibility and it depends on another very important quality which we owe the identification of this to Kenneth Boulding, and that is legitimacy. As long as the regime is perceived as legitimate, it can do anything. If you can get that switched off, it can't do anything. So how to do that is a big mystery, but it one, one part of that mystery is very clear, and that is that violent resistance is not very effective at proving that the regime is illegitimate. Matthias? So what I'm wondering is that um, I don't think this government is – I mean it's, it's – you, You're talking about our government here? Yeah, our government is perceived mm -hmm. as not being legitimate because of the election of 2000 and then what happened yeah. in 2004. And in both cases, there's evidence that it was yeah. not legitimate. But it seems like people do not really want to believe that. Yeah. They don't care. You're bringing up a very important point, and uh, it's the point that – Gandhi was emphasizing when he talked about that line between the head and the heart. People – this is a funny thing about human beings. Of course, everyone in this class is an exception, okay? But your general run of humanity, they will only believe what they want to believe, what's convenient for them to believe. So nonviolence is not really about getting them to believe something so much as it is about getting them to want to believe something. You make it somehow – and there's two ways of going about that. You want to show them that what they are clinging to is ugly, illegitimate, whatever you want to call it, and they'll be happier somewhere else. You have to do both. That's, uh, remember the famous quotation from Toynbee? about the British in India about, and about Gandhi. He made it impossible for us to go on ruling India, but he made it possible for us to leave without rancor and without humiliation. So the nonviolent actor really has to do both. Violent actor doesn't. You know, life is very easy for those people in some stupid, unsatisfying way. But yes, there is uh, – we've now reached a point – and this, this line changes, so you, you can – you can reach – you can change the degree to which people will disbelieve the truth by propaganda. But propaganda, incidentally, was invented by the British in, uh, in, the, in the First World War. Um, and now – okay, we, we're getting a little bit far afield, but this is so fascinating and can't resist. Now, you see, the problem is that the forces of reaction in this culture have a ready-made automatic propaganda machine worth $50 billion a year. They don't have to spend a dime and it works 24-7. They don't have to even pick up a finger. It's called advertising. And uh, we, we can discuss this later on in the semester, but I, want to, I don't want you to leave this course without being able to see point for point how some innocuous ad that's selling you something is actually selling you the whole paradigm which involves neoconservatism and violence and all the rest of it. Yeah? Don't you think that also the paradigm also includes powerlessness? Because I think 
Yes. Yes. That's a key part, and that's what, you know, advertising depends on your believing that you're powerless and you have to buy their product to get what you want. You know, I, I happen to know of two absolutely excellent marketing people, and they have never come up with a campaign that said, you, you know, the, the infinite spirit is within you. <laughs> You're already happy, just discover it. You don't need our product. <laughs> you, know, the just, you can see how ridiculous that's, that it would be to tell the truth in that context. So it's true that uh, all of that is going on, and, and that's why I said how this perception of legitimacy is mysterious. We don't know what does it. I think the only thing I think we can say with some s security about it is that nonviolence is very powerful at gaining legitimacy for uh, an uprising, which in, in, in turn means draining the legitimacy from a regime. And that's how paradox of repression episodes happen. And violence is very bad at this. That's about all we can say. But still, it is a fascinating thing to consider. I don't think, you know, I think there's a lot of things about nonviolence that are like this, that you cannot predict exactly when or in what form your thing is going to work. And that's where the faith element comes in. You have faith that you're doing it right, that's all you're responsible for. It kind of reminds me, I'm not sure why, of this anecdote about some person going to his spiritual director and, and saying, you're, you're always saying that, that, uh, that we should work and, that, and yet you're telling us that everything depends on God. It doesn't make sense. If everything depends on God, we should pray, not work. And if nothing depends on God, we should work, not pray. And he said, okay, work as though everything depended on you and pray as though everything depended on God. That was his formula. Okay, so it's not relevant. But I, I just thought it would be kind of neat to mention it at this point. It's similar, though, to what I'm saying, which is that we have a certain capacity, which may seem to us to be limited, but it's actually crucial to commit ourselves to the means. Then we let the ends more or less take care of themselves. That's how a nonviolent actor goes about addressing uh, changing something. Whereas with the nonviolent act, what sorry, what the violent actor says is, I've got to change that no matter what, and it's got to look exactly like this, and it has to happen now. So what I'm saying is, we can work on that marvelous paradigm shift where people begin to perceive that not only that this particular government is not legitimate, but um, that the whole style of governing is not legitimate and the, the way of carrying on international affairs is not legitimate. We've just got to work for that and you know, ac assume that if we do our work well, it will happen, if not in my lifetime, at least in yours. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, so let's go on with this. Um, the, uh, as I've mentioned, there were two, you had an array of movements that come out of this Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras. And it gives you kind of a good laboratory because the Nicaraguan experiment was basically departed from the nonviolent path pretty early. The Costa Rican one, for some funny reason, went on to become even more nonviolent until you have Costa Rica today is uh, one of the very few countries in the world that has no army. and. Uh, no, Nicaragua is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere right now. And that's partly because of the 1979 revolution made them look like something that Ronald Reagan wanted to crush. So I'm not saying that it's entirely their fault, but I am saying that it is not a coincidence that the Nicaraguan model led to such a bad conclusion and the Costa Rican model led to such a good one. Anyway, two of these four uprisings were very successful. Um, 
And they spread very quickly, and, and Patricia Parkman gives you some good examples of how the word got out and spread around. Um, Women of Honduras imitate the woman of Cuscutlan, who in this struggle has been the most heroic and self-denying. So there's two interesting things here. To what extent is this a movement that comes from particular groups? Uh, and she struggles with this issue throughout this whole little description in her whole book. In other words, what the form that the uprising takes is that of a strike. Our immediate association with strike because of our Marxist background is of a class struggle. But this is not exactly a class struggle. This is a struggle of the people as a whole against the government as a whole. In a larger sense, of course, in Central America, South America, you could say that it is a class struggle because there is a union of the rich and the powerful on top and you have the poor people living in favelas and so forth on the bottom. But it is a different kind of struggle and so in a way what matters is that people can be self-denying to bring a certain kind of power into this struggle. And the real contrast is between the mentality of the dictator who is absolutely the most self-affirming kind of person. You know, the, he says, I'm the decider and things like that. And you're my base. I'm the top of the pyramid. <laughs> Not thinking of anyone in particular, of course. Uh, <laughs> but it's the exact opposite of self-denial. So this is a recrudescence, a springing back up into life of an ideology of self-denial and this is in one way a universal human struggle that goes on and on and on throughout history, grouping itself into one form and now into another. So in that sense, it pretty much doesn't matter what class of society you come from. But when the thing gets rolling, it does matter that indeed women are brought into the struggle. That seems to be one of the really key elements. And the thing is, it almost always starts with students. That's why I say we get rid of students, we wouldn't have any of these problems. But it's, you, re, you remember if you were in last semester, critical period in the South African struggle was 19, early in 1913 when women and laborers were brought in. And when that happened, the satyagraha became invincible. So it partly does matter and partly doesn't and my famous uh, slogan, if you will, it's a little bit too long for a t-shirt, but we'll figure out something, it is it is not about, not so much about what kind of people we have in power, but what kind of power we have in people. So you can see both of those things playing themselves out here. Um, the students of Nicaragua are with the democratic students of Central America. This is on the next page. We shall sustain democracy in Central America, cost what it may. Okay, why did I emphasize those last four words? Let's just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Zoe. Mm -hmm. Um, you could link it up with karma yoga. That would be, that would be interesting. I was thinking of something a little more obvious than that. I think you're you're too smart for this kind of question. Sid. The, yes, the, yes. The, so they felt that they were at stage three of the escalation curve, and whether they were or not, it gave them a great deal of power to to be able to say that. I mean, once you say this thing has got to be overcome no matter what, they can't really stop you anymore because they'll threaten you with stuff and you've already given it up. You know, it's like Gandhi pointing out in connection with civil disobedience that the law doesn't really say you cannot X, Y, or Z. The law says if you do X, Y, or Z, we will take away X prime, Y prime, and Z prime. So if you've already given those three up, the law is powerless in that instance, in a particular setting. 
So that shows you that uh, we, we, we've identified two very important things about the spirit of this, that it was being galvanized by a sense of self-denial. And if you remember Gandhi's famous expression that, uh, that his marches and stuff and the whole struggle in general was a yatnya or sacrifice. <coughs> And really, the opposition is claiming that it is undergoing sacrifice also. It's kind of a duplicitous game that they're playing. Okay, so they know that this is extreme. They are involving different elements of society, and they are appealing to the, the desire to sacrifice self, which actually turns out to be, though you'd never uh, get that impression from our culture, it turns out to be a very deep motivation, people. Once you've touched that, you can really go almost anywhere. Um, just up a once a couple of sentences earlier than that, I want to point out that on June 23rd in Guatemala, students, teachers, and lawyers in Guatemala City initiated another massive shutdown consciously modeled on that of El Salvador. And uh, in, again, in one week, on July 1st, the president of Guatemala, Jorge Ubico, resigned. So I'm interested here keenly in the consciously modeled part because the, the single most uh, detrimental factor in peace development worldwide has been the lack of a learning process. So that every time you start a movement, you have to reinvent the wheel and start it all over again. And this is th perhaps the most hopeful development in nonviolence over the last 20, 25 years. But of course, as you can see, it started earlier in terms of local regions. But now, gee, globalism could mean the globalization of nonviolence. So that, why not? So that people in one corner of the world would learn from what their brothers and sisters in another corner of the world did, and they could start at square three instead of square one. And they could reach a tipping point, and we could actually live in England's green and pleasant land here, or build Jerusalem, or whatever it was that Blake said. So um, I did want to touch on one other thing, so let me just um, quickly point out it's useful to bear these technical terms in mind because then we can prove to our parents and other citizens of California that we have not wasted their tr tuition money. So do remember the uh, concept of brazos caídos, arms dropped. But again, there's something, there's an important principle behind it and that's this, that again we, we're talking about is not people creating an alternative they haven't said anything about loving their opponents. What they're talking about is withdrawal of cooperation, of assent, consent. So we're talking about the most, I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. It's not working. <laughs> the most primitive form of nonviolence. That's to say, I will not go along with your X, Y, Z, whatever it is, your killing thing. You, you can't get my compliance with this. That's, how, that's the bare beginning of nonviolence. We're going to look at episodes and movements where it was carried much further than that. Um, okay, do you have anything else that you would like to emphasize, highlight, or question in this little description? I think it's kind of been a good exercise in how to get information out of these things. If not, I'll spend the concluding few minutes on an, a rather poignant case of nonviolence. Okay? <coughs> okay, on we go. For a finale today, I would like to share with you a resource and a movement. The resource is a book that you have in your list of resources right after the syllabus in the reader. It's a kind of encyclopedia called Protest, Power, and Change, an encyclopedia of nonviolent action from act up to women's suffrage. And uh, I was afraid of this. Hang on just a second. The movement that I wanted to share with you, 
Okay, here we go. Took place in January of 1948, so we're still talking about this World War II era and non-war things that are going on in the world. And here's my surprise for today. This is, this is the cookie for, for today. It took place in Iraq. Just imagine. So let's talk about what happened briefly and talk about what the repercussions are, what, what that means for us here today. The, this is called correctly by these authors a predominantly nonviolent movement. So again, let's remember that this is very weak because it's in violation of Nagler's Law. I'm sure the Nagler's Law is the 11th commandment. You know, you cannot violate it without losing lots of power. But you really can't expect to see nonviolence doing its stuff if you mix it up with a little bit of violence just to make sure. So somehow everything goes over to the violence when you do that. But this was, okay, a predominantly nonviolent movement. The situation was that there was a treaty in Iraq. The British, who basically created Iraq, made a treaty with that country that, guess what, gave them control over the oil reserves. Surprise, surprise. And they also put in a nice <coughs> puppet ruler to make sure that everything would go along smoothly. 1948 came time to the renewal of the treaty. And they, by this time, they hated uh, Salih Jaber, who was the head of the country, who had been put in there by the British. And um, the people decided they wouldn't have it. And they, while he was in England ratifying the treaty, the streets of Baghdad were in an utter turmoil, but a very different kind of turmoil from the streets of Baghdad today, you'd hardly say. It, it's demonstrations and strikes, and it's going to lead to the resignation of the Prime Minister, Salif Jaber, and to the repudiation of the treaty, so that from 1948 until the next round of colonialism in 1990, the Iraqis actually had control to some degree over their own oil reserves. Um, there were other issues. There were food shortages, and basically uh, Jobber was very unpopular by that time. And I think this is actually kind of unfortunate because I think nonviolence works best when it focuses on one issue, and it's an issue of principle, and they stick to that issue, and you even carry out what's called uh, what is it called? Anyone remember from last semester? No fresh. no fresh issue. Thank you, Amy. So you stick to that until it's secured, and then you go on to something else. So the fact that they hated the guy is actually not a plus for us. It means that it was easier to overthrow him, but it means that the overthrow was not quite as much a victory for nonviolence as it was just a victory of the Iraqi people. Um, he comes back to Baghdad and the demonstrations are so severe that he couldn't even land in the Iraqi airport. He, he had to land in, the, in a, mil, a British military airport and travel up to Baghdad in disguise, disfrazada. And um, on January 26th, he ordered the police to use machine guns to disperse a protest demonstration. Okay, let's do a little role play here. Imagine that you're average Joe reporter. And you've never taken PAX 164. You've never heard of it. There are, you're living there in outer darkness in Northgate Hall here, learning to be a journalism student. And you want to finish the story. So Jobber uses machine guns to dispel the demonstrators. What would you say? He has more power than the people, right? So what's going to be the outcome? The people leave. Yeah, they were dispersed. They saw those machine guns and they said, uh, whatever, however you say this in Arabic, I'm getting the hell out of here. Uh, but now let's suppose that you have taken Pax 164 and you have a clue and you're writing real news. Uh, tell me what you think would happen. And you can even tell me what it's called and where to find it on my website, Catherine. Paradox, Paradox of Repression, which predicts that what will happen.
Well, you know, that is a very, that's also a very good point, that once the police have been required to use live ammunition and kill people, they start losing their nerve. And there's even a case not in Iraq, but in Iran, where it was very, very, very violent in the 79 revolution, where one soldier was ordered to fire on the crowds, and he refused, and they started giving him a hard time, and he shot his commanding officer, and then shot himself. Yeah, but it, it can be that extreme. But what do you think would happen to the movement when this act of extreme violence is exerted against them? Zoe? If you use the tools of, of violence, it's very likely that the same tools would be used against you in return. So they yes. Okay. This is, OK, I guess what we're coming down to here is just one of two possibilities. We're either going to have a Sharpville episode where, oh, that's right, you weren't in PAX 64A. When you use nonviolence against an unarmed demonstration, the people lose their nerve and they resort to violence. Mm -hmm. But there's another possibility. What if they don't lose their nerve? What is going to happen? Well, let me just read you the sentence. Um, Jobber ordered police to use machine guns to disperse protest demonstrations. In response to this threat, thousands of Iraqis poured into the streets in protest. Exactly what we saw with Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan's red shirt moving movement. I said movie because it, it is now a movie uh, from movement to movie uh, in the Northwest Frontier province. Okay, what I am not saying is every time you use violence, there'll be a paradox of repression. I mean, you use violence as a, an oppressor. It doesn't always happen. Again, it's one of these things where it's a, it's an, it's a principle, but it may not you cannot always predict exactly what the outcome will be. But this was a very plausible outcome given nonviolent logic, and it's a completely impossible outcome given standard uh, jur journalism school logic. Over the weekend, you want something to think about while you're reading all of this stuff on the other insurrectionary movements. Just think, what if we knew about this in 1990. Just think what could be going on today in Iraq. I think it'd be fun to spend a few minutes just uh, visualizing what could have happened, what we could be living through now. Okay, folks, have a great weekend. I'll see you. What did you say? <laughs>